Welcome, Ben Mama. Texas Instruments TI-99 4A computer always seems to get a lot of attention when I cover it on the channel. It might be regarded as a failure by many of the retro gaming commentators out there, but it seems to be very fondly remembered by the people who owned one back in the day. This is very much backed up by its credible 8th place finish in my viewer voted 20 greatest home computers of all time video that I did quite recently. I had previously covered the TI-99 in my Amazing Facts series, but I thought it was time to focus on its games, and see what exclusives it has to offer. I have to say that I was pleasantly surprised by my discoveries, and the more TI-99 games I discovered, the more I understood why it has such a passionate community of fans. It feels very much different to its contemporaries like the Apple II and Atari 8-bit, with its unique visual style, well for the time anyway, as the TI graphics chip soon became pretty commonplace, impressive audio and quirky original games. Rather than being dominated by arcade ports and coin-up clones like most systems of the time were, the TI-99 has a pretty big selection of original games that you can't find anywhere else. It does also have some very good arcade conversions too of course, but that's for another video. After much deliberation, I've got my selection down to just 10 games that I think give you a really good representation of just what the amazing 16-bit Texas Instruments computer has to offer and I hope that this pleases the hardcore TI-99ers just as much as those discovering the system for the first time. This is my Texas Instruments home computer. Great for learning. The only thing wrong is I never get to use it. See, this morning the kids learned about math. Perfect. This afternoon, my neighbors learned how to balance their budget. Then these guys came by to learn how to fight aliens. Now I'm going to learn chess. Observe the master. With the home computer from Texas Instruments, you're not just playing, you're learning. Checkmate! Well, I guess you can learn from losing. Created by John C. Plaster, Tombstone City is an incredibly original title for the TI-99 that may seem a bit complicated as I explain it, but the moment you start playing it, it will soon become second nature. In the game, you control a ship called a schooner, and your job is to try and keep your town safe from some mysterious creatures called the Morgues, and increase its population. You can shoot the Morgues as they appear on your lands, but when you do they leave a cactus behind, which gets in your way. Not only that though, if you end up with two cacti next to each other they will start to spawn more Morgues. The only way you can remove these pesky plants is by shooting a Morgue as it passes right next to them. But this is very tricky, and requires expert timing. The morgues won't enter the centre of the town, a grid of blocks in the middle, so you're safe there if you need some respite. Aside from eliminating the morgues, you'll also need to get rid of the tumbleweed too, if you want your town's population to grow. The ultimate goal is to leave only individual cacti standing, so no more morgues can spawn. When all cacti stand alone, the day ends. The player is awarded a bonus schooner, and a new day begins, with all the cacti repositioned. This has to be one of the best TI-99 games I've played. One of the most famous games to make use of the TI-99 speech synthesizer, Alpina is a highly original title that was quite notable at the time for being designed by a female programmer, one Janet Srimushnam. In the game you are tasked with climbing to the top of six perilous mountains, taking in Mount Hood, the Matterhorn, Mount Kenya, Mount McKinley, Mount Garmo and Mount Everest. There are two types of hazards that make your job harder, 
The first of these are the natural occurrences like trees and rocks that get in your way, and avalanches, which have to be avoided at all costs. Then there are the residents of these mountains, which include snakes and bears that will attack you if you get too close. If you are hit by an avalanche or attacked by an animal, you will get knocked back down the mountain, sometimes to the very start. However, if you time it right you can grab onto a ledge to halt your descent. If you do fall all the way, you lose a life. Whilst placing your flag at the top will reward you with an extra one. I already mentioned the game's use of speech, but I can't think of another for the TI-99 where the feature is so beneficial. This is because the voice alerts you of hazards in advance, giving you vital seconds to react. It's easy to see why Alpiner is remembered so fondly by TI-99ers. Horizontally scrolling shoot em up Parsec has long been regarded as the TI-99's killer app, and I can see why, as it's certainly a quality product. Designed by Paul Urbanus and Jim Dramis, the latter of which also programmed Car Wars and Munchman for the TI-99, this is a pretty standard example of the genre for the era, in many ways, as you simply fly your ship across the screen taking out the enemies and try not to get shot yourself. However, there are two further hazards that you'll have to watch out for. Firstly, your laser weapon can overheat if you use it too much, so you need to keep an eye on its temperature. Secondly, you have to watch out for the landscape below, because colliding with a building or mountain will kill you instantly. Enemies arrive in waves, and you cannot clear a wave until all enemies are eliminated. Some ships can simply be avoided, but they will just wrap around and come back again, so this doesn't really help out that much. Bigger ships will arrive on their own, smaller ships in groups, and they always follow the same patterns. Once you clear all the attack waves, you enter an asteroid field, come out the other end intact, and you progress to the next level, of which there are 16 in total. Parsec is a pretty tough game, but once you start to learn the patterns and waves, you'll progress further and further. It also makes really good use of the speech module too. <laughs> One thing I've very much learned since I started on my voyage of discovery with the TI-99 is that it has a lot of really weird and wonderful games. But of all the games I've played on the computer, Snigit is perhaps the strangest of them all. In the game you control a hen trying to protect her eggs from a hungry snake. The game is played on a fixed screen with eggs, nests and various plants and trees dotted around it at random. The snake roams freely around the screen, only stopping when he bumps into a tree or plant. If he comes into contact with an egg, he'll eat it immediately, whether it be in a nest or out in the wild. You have to grab each egg, put it into a nest, and then protect it until it hatches into a chick, who will run off the screen. Now you're probably wondering how you fend off the snake. Well, it can only attack you and kill you from the back. If it hits you from the front, it's turned away by your sharp beak. So this is how you can protect the eggs and nests, by standing to either the left or right of them. All the eggs are coloured and some colours are worth more than others. You have to be very careful carrying and dropping the eggs as it's very easy to break them. Once you hatch enough chicks, you move them to the next level for more of the same, only harder. It takes a little while to get the hang of Snagit, but once you do you'll find a really enjoyable little game.
built and Bradley Zero Zap wasn't just one of the original seven launch games for the TI-99 computer back in 1979, it was also notable for being the very first third party title for the computer. It would be very much a sign of things to come, but its quirky and original gameplay has often been described as a variation of pinball. I can see where people are coming from by saying that, but it's a bit of a misleading description in my opinion, as this plays very differently indeed, despite some obvious visual similarities. Each play field shows a screen made up of numbered bumpers, blocks and big red X symbols. At the bottom you have an up arrow that you use to launch the ball by moving it into position and pressing fire. The idea is to keep the ball in the play field as long as possible, so where you send it from the start is absolutely crucial. If the ball hits a number, you're rewarded that score and it turns into an X. If it hits an X, it bounces off and that in turn turns into a number whilst hitting a block, moves it to a new position and deflects the ball. You lose a ball in two ways, either by it falling off the playfield at the bottom or if it hits a zero, the only number that doesn't award you score, killing you instantly instead. The levels can be randomised, redesigned or skipped, which gives the game a lot more replay value. Zero Zap is a really fun little game for the TI-99 4A. <laughs> it was just Atari that had an ET game right? Well, the main reason I've included this one here is not because it's an amazing game, but more the story behind the game, and the fact that most people don't even know it exists. The story goes that Texas Instruments had paid Spielberg and his studio three million dollars to make a series of games based on the friendly alien, and as he had with Atari before them, part of this agreement was a clause that he had to personally approve each game. TI had developed seven different games in total, a mix of both educational products and arcade style offerings, and called in the legendary director to sign them off. But as soon as he saw the games he blew his top and demanded they all be cancelled immediately and the contract torn up. Firstly he was angry that this game and E.T. in his Adventures at Sea, an educational title, had already been released. Secondly, he was furious that none of the games seemed to have anything to do with the original subject matter, other than featuring E.T. And when you take one look at this title, you can understand his frustration, as it's nothing more than a Frogger clone, and not a particularly good one at that, with some strange gameplay quirks. For example, you can only jump on platforms when they turn green, otherwise you die. But hey, it's certainly a great talking point. <laughs> cool 3D shoot em up, you're the captain of the USS Recovery, who has been sent to the moon to recapture some treasure that's been stolen from Earth by the evil Zygonaut. All these goodies have been stored in a deep mine shaft, so you'll need to guide your ship down it to recover them. Of course, this isn't just a simple grab and go, as Zygonaut has sent some of his minions to stop you. Your ship has lasers that can be lined up on each side of the screen to eliminate them as they come towards you, but you can't fire continuously if you do your guns will overheat and then kill a member of your crew. You will also need to keep your water topped up as this will also kill a crew member if it runs out. And those crew members are vital, as when you do find one of the missing treasures or a pool of water, you will have to send one of them out to recover it. The moment you do this an alien will attack, but a well taken shot from your phaser will stop them in their tracks. Pressing space releases a crew member and also opens the airlock for their return. 
you can earn extra crew members by recovering treasure successfully. The 3D effect in Moonmine is pretty cool, and although the gameplay is fairly generic, the extra recovery element really helps keep things interesting. From one pseudo 3D game to another, as we now take a look at Milton Bradley's Space Bandits. What we have here is another game that borrows elements from other titles of the era, while still being pretty unique and original in its own right. I suppose the best way I can describe it is that a pseudo 3D version of the hit arcade game Wizard of War. Like Midway's more famous title, you move a soldier around a maze, shooting different types of enemy, before moving on to the next level. But the main way it differs is the need to also collect power crystals, but obviously the 3D element is a pretty important feature too. This means that you not only have to move in the regular four directions, but also in and out of the screen. The 3D element doesn't just affect the way you move around though, it also changes the way you fire, as the bullets will now wrap around the whole maze. This adds a really interesting tactical element, as you can actually kill an enemy from the opposite side of the screen as long as you're on the same level. Killed enemies will also leave behind an energy ball for a short time too, which kills you on contact and blocks your path, adding another more tactical element. Space Bandits is a little strange at first, but once you get your head around the 3D viewpoint, it becomes very enjoyable indeed. you'll be very interested to discover that The Attack was originally a game based on the classic sci-fi movie Alien, but after they were unable to secure the license, they renamed it and adapted it slightly for the new plot. It's also interesting to see that the game shares more than a few assets with another early Milton Bradley title in Zero's app, which you may have already noticed given I showed the game earlier in this video. Once you start playing, the original license attached to it actually makes a lot of sense, as you're trapped on a ship and must eliminate the alien spores before they merge together to form aliens. The spores spawn from numbered incubators around the screen, and can't actually harm you, so eliminating them is fairly easy, but the sheer number of them is what causes the problem, because unless you zip around the screen really quickly, much more dangerous aliens will appear. Once all the incubators are empty, which you can track by the ever decreasing number on them, the level ends with your score docs for any remaining spores. As the levels increase, you will also start to see the aliens themselves spawn from these incubators, so you need to shoot them as quickly as possible. The attack certainly doesn't look like much, but the gameplay is strangely compelling.
might be interested to know that Chisholm Trail is the unofficial sequel to Tombstone City, which was featured at the very start of this video. It was also written by the same person, John C. Plaster, and features more than a few visual similarities, as you'll no doubt see, as well as several pretty similar gameplay mechanics too. The plot is some nonsense about you trying to get your cattle to market whilst avoiding rustlers and wranglers, making it sound a bit like Activision Stampede. But in actual fact, this is a top-down shooter that reminded me quite a lot of the classic XD arcade game Targ. Like Targ, you move your ship around the grid in all four directions, shooting the enemies and try not to get killed yourself. However, there are three main differences here. Firstly, the enemies shoot back. Secondly, your own fire is limited, so must be used wisely. And lastly, there's the perimeter lasers. If you stay in line with one of these for more than a few seconds, they'll take you out. As they're positioned all around the screen, you constantly have to watch your position and keep moving. It's fair to say that Chisholm Trail isn't a particularly easy game, even on the lowest difficulty setting, but its fast action gameplay certainly keeps you coming back for more. He's only three, and already he's reaching out, seeking, and looking to you to point the way. Now is when a Texas Instruments home computer can give him a real head start. With more educational cartridges than any other computer, they challenge, encourage, make learning fun. The home computer from Texas Instruments. Don't put it off. And that rounds up my look at 10 amazing Texas Instruments TI-99 4A exclusives. Can you think of any other one-off titles that only ever came out for the quirky 16-bit computer? Or do you think some of these games were unworthy of inclusion? I also love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience, so please get typing in that comment section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons and YouTube backers in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Grady Haynes, Mitchell Valentino, Seth A. Robinson, Carl Olson, Dos Gamer Man, Sonic Mania 999, Paul Daniel, Andrew McKay, Retro Resolution, Matt Standish, James Taylor, Trogdor the Burninator, 8 Bit Guy, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to extra content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the lad, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.